Welcome to episode seven of Staying Alive with me, Jesse Smith, a podcast about how to make a career out of artistry and never look back. I hope you've all had a great week. I've been busy locked up in my studio, busily creating content, which seems to be the new norm for musicians in these strange times we're living in. With less human interaction, we're getting our dopamine hit from likes, comments and shares on our online output. This week, as well as my live stream, I released a cover of Led Zeppelin's Going to California and a collaboration on a song called Last Night on Earth, co-written by one of my great friends, Tom Wilcox, which you can go check out now. My band Romances is also releasing something new this week, so keep your eyes peeled for that. Today's guest is an actor, writer and producer. He made his West End theatrical debut in Our Boys in 2012 and also starred in Kevin Elliott's My Night with Reg. He also starred in Channel 4 and Netflix's series Crazy Head, ITV's Unforgotten and as Gareth Walker in FIFA's The Journey. He also plays David in the brand new HBO and BBC show, I May Destroy You. Only this Friday, his short film Lola won three awards at the Independent Shorts Awards Ceremony. We recorded this chat in the height of lockdown and start the chat off talking about football, which is now back. And yes, it's made lockdown a lot easier. Today's guest is the first actor to be a guest on the pod, and it is my pleasure to welcome the incredible... Lewis Reeves. So, do you think uh, coronavirus is a conspiracy theory started by Ole Gunnar Solskjaer to stop Liverpool winning the league? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, he's conspired with flat earthers. <laughs> Just a load of them got together. There was a video on the rounds the other day of some guy on Twitter. I think he was, um, I think he was a mank, and he was like, "Oh, this is the day that Liverpool would have won the league." And then he just really? had like primal scream on or something. I was just dancing to it, and I was just like, "I can't help but find it funny." But all yeah. at the same time, I watched that video, and then I was just so sad. What do you think is going to happen? I think, from what I've read in bits and bobs, I think they're going to... I think the organisations, like the TV organisations and Premier League organisations, are going to make them finish it because mm. of the financial implications. For clubs like Burnley, yeah, yeah, they'll just, they'll just go bust without it. We love football, so talking from a football perspective, it would be sacrilege and such a shame if you guys didn't win the league because you've been so good this year. <laughs> but, you know, but obviously with uh, with everything going on, it's sort of secondary, isn't it? Really, it is. I miss it so much, though. I may. I think honestly, football's the thing I miss most in isolation. Actually, um, playing it, watching it, yeah, it would all be all right actually if we could just sit and watch the the football. That that is the thing. <laughs> if I had to sit in for a few weeks, but the World Cup was on or whatever, or the Euros, yeah. Absolutely fine. I can yeah. really dive into that. Cool, mate. We're recording, by the way. So uh, I'll okay. just introduce you briefly. So uh, this is my great friend, Lewis Reeves. I'm so happy he's on the podcast today. Um, this is an interesting one for me, mate, because obviously coming from a music background, there's going to be a lot of questions that might seem like layman's terms to you because I don't know, honestly, don't know that much about the acting game. And, and, that's well, why it's two of us. So. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's why I'm just super, super happy because, like I said to you when I asked you to do this, um, you know, you don't really sit down the pub and just talk through your mates' careers, do you? You talk about what's been going on, you know, socially and in their lives and football and everything else. So, yeah, I'm really, really happy that you've agreed to do this, mate. So, thank you. Oh, mate, thanks for having me on board. I'm chuffed. It's something to do. Oh, it's either this or hang out with my wife and child. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's, it's an absolute no-brainer. It's respite for a bit. So yeah. it's quite funny because uh, I think I, I woke up about an hour ago. It's now 
quarter to midday. What time were you up this morning? I've been up since quarter past five. Quarter past five, yeah. 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 How, how times have changed. <laughs> and, I, and I will be in bed. I'll be, I'll be looking at my watch going, ooh, 7pm. I might call this a day soon. Really? So even if the football was on, you couldn't watch it? I would not be awake for match of the day. <laughs> There's no way. In fact, I understand why match of the day is on in the morning now. Yeah. <laughs> on a Sunday, because that is the only time that me and Charlotte get to watch it. <laughs> and there's no way that we, uh, we we stay. Saying that, she's a really good sleeper, but you're just, you're just so knackered trying to keep the little one entertained. Yeah, yeah. It's, but it's, rewarding, I imagine. Yeah, it's, do you know it's lovely, if there any positives can come out of it, it's nice, it's giving us a real moment of stillness and just like, it's making me be very present. Mm. Just taking every day as it comes. If I start thinking like, oh shit, uh, work what's going to happen what's going on the horizon how long is this going to take mm. it. Oh. but yesterday we just got out of the house and we're so lucky we just went and we went down to the beach and yeah, uh, yeah had You're a down in Margate aren't you yeah, yeah. and it was yeah. India's first time having a so we've gone from having a one bed flat in East London um, uh, we got out just in time really we moved early February um, because we, we couldn't really afford London and the sort of lifestyle that we wanted to uh, give um, India. Um, and it's such a scary move. But yesterday, you know, walking along the beach and watching India have a little paddle, me and Charlotte was like, ugh. Yeah. Oh, the that's lovely. best thing we've ever done. It's a good place to start because obviously you were born up north in Doncaster and then you moved down to Marlow and then you've obviously been in London and you obviously were in Cardiff for a while and now you're down in Margate. So firstly, where, where feels like home? And and do you think do you think travelling and moving around and living in different places is an, an experience in different things helps you as an actor? Uh, yeah, I think, it, I think it does. I think I could sort of... I, it's a weird one. Especially because when people say, who would you support? And I'm like, oh, Doncaster. And yeah. Then, and go, sorry, what? Yeah. Um, I've always sort of felt like I haven't really belonged anywhere. Like moving from up north to down south, you know, when I go back up north, people would be like, oh, you're, from, you're a southerner now. Yeah, yeah. And, and then vice versa. So I've always had that... Um, that thing of not really feeling a bit of like a bit of a traveler, not really feeling really there is one place that is home. Yeah. Well, uh, how old were you when you moved to, to Marlow from London? So I was pretty young. I was probably like 10, 11. Mm. Um, but we didn't even, you know, and then we were like in Marlow and then we went to Abingdon and we came back to Marlow and then I went to Cardiff and then London. So it's always, it's always sort of changed up. It, it's helped with accents though. Yeah, my, yeah, for my sure. ear pick up things. So if like something, I get a breakdown for an audition, it doesn't really phase me too much. Yeah, I yeah. I feel really confident doing it. I probably get in and they're like, "What the fuck? Was that? <laughs> what is that accent?" Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, obviously your your Brummy accents are pretty good, mate. I've seen that one in action. No, thanks very much. <laughs> Cheers. Cheers. Did, did you always know you wanted to be an actor? No. No, I, I think I, I mean, two younger brothers and a strong female role model, my mum, we were just fighting all the time for attention from her. So I think it kind of just from showing off. Sure. I was a, yeah, <laughs> I was a really, really nervous kid. Like, I used to have, like, a stammer. Um, so I think my mum, it took my mum, you know, you know a, a decade or so trying to get my confidence up. We'd go to, like, martial arts and stuff like that try and learn a discipline because we were such nervous kids. And I think it kind of backfired her on a bit because right. she, could, she made us like super confident, overconfident, cocky is probably the word. You're quite similar, aren't you, the three of you really, in, in a lot of ways, do you think? Yeah, I, th I think so. I think, I, especially me and Joel, there's such a big gap between me and Callum. Yeah, yeah. It's like 10, 11 years. Yeah. It's almost like a bit of a fatherish sort of role in it yeah, really. yeah. he's direct competition yeah <laughs> your, your, your mum obviously you mentioned your mum there Nick she's just an incredible woman isn't she she's just like this sort of ball of love and uh, she obviously she has this amazing company called IndieB which we should plug and yeah, um, she sent us a box of stuff which is uh, 
it's just amazing, isn't it? Yeah. It's, what does she do? It's all like hand washes and natural vegan kind of bath bombs and things like that. And it's incredible. Yeah, they're, they're ethical products as well. So they're like, there's no wastage or everything's reusable. And a lot of uh, companies, I don't think I can mention names, but they'll process to be vegan or whatever, but they'll be like paraffins or parabens in the product, which actually won't be vegan or good for the environment. So my mum's, you know, gone away and she's, really put the time in into like um all sorts of sort of scientific courses in order to learn how to what's the best way to make these products ethical and vegan mm. and sort of just taken off and they're, they're amazing yeah our really? flat smells like so much better since we since that box of stuff was delivered amazing, <laughs> amazing. Paul so should we talk about um Cardiff so obviously you went off to you went off to uni to um Royal Welsh, right? Yeah. Um, did you enjoy your training? The reason I ask that is because so many musician friends of mine, they go to music college and they go, oh, I didn't really like it, didn't learn anything. But it's, And what they get out of it is the fact that they meet people and they play in bands and they, they kind of get on the job experience, as it were, being at uni. But is it different? Do you Did you enjoy the kind of nitty gritty of the training and learning how to act so to speak <clears throat> yeah it was kind of like a mixed bag so I went to drama school and I think a lot of people go to drama school the idea is you go there it helps you yeah you learn a few things but you get an agent you get a showcase and if you go to a good drama school which like which like Royal Welsh is it's one of the best in the country um you get that uh, that stage, that little soapbox for people to then push you on into into a professional industry. Um, and uh, the for me, when I was going there, I had this idea. I like I had my jazz pumps, right. I had my flags, <laughs> I'd read Stanislavski. I had this idea. I was like, I know what acting is. Yeah, <laughs> bit of a twat, really. I had a lot of growing up to do, and I didn't know this. I didn't want to say it, mate, but yeah, thanks. Yeah, <laughs> did you struggle with your time in Cardiff because you're really different now. <laughs> We're a bit of a prick. <laughs> um, so I think what happened to me, long story short, is I went with this idea of like to be an actor, of like this deep thing or like, this dark, mysterious thing, which I'm not. You know, that's not the type of person. I'm not Robert De Niro. I'm not going to be the next Tom Hardy. You know, I'm not this gritty thing. And it took, and I nearly got kicked out in my first year um, because I think when people, and it's true with music or anything, when you're trying to be something that you're not and with acting or being on stage or performance, it's got to come from truth. Totally. Um, because people will call it. People will go, that's bullshit. You're pretending. That's not, I don't buy it. And I had this moment, there was a project, I can't really remember, whereas I just, we were devising something and something came just from me and I just, I think I, I was just being myself, really. And everyone digged it. Everyone was like, oh, it was so funny, it was really great, it was really entertaining. And I was like, it was like a little light bulb. Mm. When I, and I was like, ah, that's what I've got to tap into. Yeah. And the scariest thing, because when it's coming from you, it's the most vulnerable place to be. Totally. And then from that point, I let that bleed out and everything and let my training really seep in. And it's, I sort of didn't, I didn't really look back. And I've only sort of, you know, it's taken, you know, a near on decade to understand what type of artist I am and what artist I want to be and where I want to go. Mm. Um, but that was a real breakthrough through moment for me. So, yeah, the training was, was massive for me. I don't think I'd be the same person without it, actually. Yeah, I think I think that castability thing that that kind of is sort of I was going to say trans <laughs> trans genre then yeah not, not transgender you know what I mean yeah. um, trans genre because uh, I remember specifically doing this um, when I was doing thriller do it doing this kind of after I think it was after the matinee little kind of uh, Q and A with the kids and there was there was the the kind of the cast of the show on stage and there was this school of children they kind of been more than sort of 10 or 11 and um they were they were sort of saying you know asking us questions or whatever and the guy that was playing uh, michael jackson um you have to be a certain type of person i'm going to say to play michael jackson in the west end just you know okay, okay. um 
and usually he, he, he's a lovely guy david jordan he's he's a really great guy an incredible uh dancer and and singer yeah he, he actually had a hit in that you might remember um Go on. From, from the I, th- I guess it was the early 2000s when the sun goes down free oh my god da, 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 da. anyway it was it was it was kind That's of thing that thing. yeah yeah it's called when the sun goes down you, you can you can do better than that yeah <laughs> anyway i digress so so we we were on stage and and um he, these this little kid who must have been about 10 was like uh you know what what advice would you give somebody who wants to you know make it in the industry and we were like you know doing the kind of stock thing you know just you know really practice as hard as you can and just be the best that you can be and david jordan just said no just be the best he was like there's no point being the best that you can be he's like if you're not the best you're not going to get the gig and I, we kind of all looked at him like, dude, like this is a class of 10 year olds. You've just, you know, but actually it really struck a chord a bit. I always remember it because it's like, especially in musical theatre or, you know, I guess, I guess being in a play or being in a film or, or a, you know, there's only one role, you know, there's only one role for that person and you have to be the right person for that role. And there's no point, like you're saying, you know, if, if Tom Hardy's up for it and he does that thing better than you, then yeah. you've got to find where you're better than Tom Hardy, haven't you? You've got to find where you sit in the industry. Yeah, it, but it's it's a very, very tough one. And I think it's why people who are performers can be of a sensitive, shall we say, disposition. Mm-hmm. Or, you know, can, it can be really tough mentally mm-hmm. because you can be the best. You can be the best that you can be. You can be the best singer in that room that day but the producer just likes that other person. So, you know, there's, yeah, so- yeah, yeah. there's about five or six cogs, isn't there? You've got to impress your agent, your agent to sign you, to get the audition, to be able to do the audition, to do well, get through that round, and then producers, a director to like you, the people who are execs to like you. So it's like all these things have to line up yeah. in order for you to... So, yes, what he is saying is true, but also what i think you guys are saying as well i think there's a fine there's a merge somewhere isn't there yeah it's you're right it's like, it's like a sliding doors moment isn't it it's just got to be the right place at the right time right place right time but then to also when it is that time be ready yeah yeah exactly which is tough because it's not uh, technically that's not fair just yeah because, yeah you, know, you you missed that bus you couldn't you couldn't get to your audition that day so that person got it or you know, like so many times it's happened to me, uh, I was second, third on the list, but someone else was shooting something else and they went to do that job instead, so I got the job. Yeah. So you look at that as in, like, oh, shit, like, I'm down their list, like, the director, I'm not his first choice, or this is a great shot for me. I'm going yeah. to make the most of it. I'm going to be ready. Yeah, totally. You know? And... The first first thing I saw you in, I think I've probably probably seen you in other things before, like small. Did I have the clothes game. on? Uh, I think you did actually. It was oh, okay. probably it, oh. it was probably our boys actually. Which oh, was, okay. was that was that was that your West End debut? That was my West End debut. Yeah, yeah. and it was it was yeah, 2012, right? Yeah, oh. it's a long time ago. It's yeah. amazing because I was looking at the dates the other day, and actually. We were pretty much. I think. I think there might have been. So when when would that have finished? Sort of beginning of 2013 was it? Was it end of 2012? Yeah. So, we, so, so yeah. So we were basically about 300 yards apart in theatres in the West End, weren't we? You and me, because I was in Thriller uh, about six months later. So it's just bizarre that uh, you it know. Is funny. <laughs> it's very similar to me and Charlotte actually when I did mine out with Reg. When that came into town at the Apollo, she was doing Jersey Boys at the Piccadilly. That's so we were literally round, round the corner. That was yeah. that was super cool. Yeah, yeah. Good that was cool. Good Enjoyed that. Then. I loved working in Soho, actually. I could talk about Soho all afternoon and just just working there and sort of Mate. spending time there. And, Best. Yeah. Best. But, um, but, yeah, that role specifically, it's quite a... I mean, from the outside looking in, it looked like a really challenging role. I mean, you were sort of wheelchair bound for part of it. And you, you it was kind of a, it's a play, if people haven't seen it, about like young military veterans, isn't it? And um, you were with 
uh, Matthew Lewis and Arthur Darville. And obviously Matthew Lewis will remember me from when I was an extra in Harry Potter. Um, so he, I worked with him yeah. too. Did he, he mention me? about you. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, so, you know, it's like, quite... Wait, call me. If we're hanging out together, don't bother him in front of me. <laughs> don't embarrass me, for fuck's sake. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, mate. So, so yeah, that... Um, yeah, can no, you just talk to me about that role? And... Um, yeah, do you know what? A lot of... I get loads of... You know, it's lovely. I get loads of praise for doing that part. But so the part um, was a soldier that had inflicted a head wound. He, a head wound. He had a. It's based on a real character. The Jonathan Lewis spent a couple of weeks um, as a soldier himself uh, on this uh, army ward. So he, he saw all of these amazing characters and these amazing stories, and decided to put a play on. Uh, and at the time, where he saw how society treated soldiers uh, and how they integrated themselves back into society so to speak um and with my character in particular he was a really young lad i think he was the youngest one uh, he'd been hit in the head with uh, uh, a piece of shell and he had an amazing arc because you saw him at the beginning and he, he was near on brain, brain dead in this sort of in this wheelchair and bed bound and he has this total arc where sorry to ruin it for anyone but he comes out at the end you know, and he's sort of saluting. He's in his, um, you know, his green beret, and he's he's going going back into the service. So it was like an amazing part to do. It, you know, in some some respects. Um, um, but I, there was such a, a, f- a freedom with it, like because we'd done I'd done so much training at drama school, like with movement and and things like that. People, you just have to commit. You know, if you're doing someone with like a speech impediment or you they have a disability, you just have to do your research and then just find the freedom in it. Really go there. Don't be afraid to, you know, you're going to offend someone or you're going to, you know, because you have to talk with, you know, your tongue's built like this and you have to do these sort of things. Mm. Um, and as soon as, because at first I was a bit scared about doing it, and as soon as I just let go of any apprehension or offending anyone, like that truth thing again, people just sort of, you know, seem to really enjoy it. And I just, I love doing that every night, getting to sit, you have that, that sort of, um, that art. Journey every night, yeah. yeah. Great, great story to tell, I enjoyed it. And is, um, just for people that might be interested in sort of how you get from being in college to being in the West End, like, obviously, you mentioned your agent, it was your agent of, obviously, a really important person for you. So was it your agent that got you that audition? Yeah, I mean, your, your agent is... I mean, I've changed my agent quite a few times. Right. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, they're in a, an absolute integral part. Um, you can do it solo, but it's just so much more work. Mm-hmm. Um, so they're that person, you know, if you can get a good relationship, that gets you through the door. Everything else, you know, you've got to, you know, read the play, be a nice person to work with and do the job well. Yeah. Um, but yeah, the, the, getting an agent is is a, a a pivotal part of doing it, which is why it's good to go to drama school and get good training because then they'll um, be able to give you a platform and a showcase where you can meet people. Mm. Um, and how, did you did you really did you enjoy being in the West End? Was it something you enjoyed doing? I like obviously now nowadays you do more more film and TV stuff. Yeah, for the first time around, I enjoyed it a little bit too much. Did you? Yeah, I got a crude awakening when I finished that show. I was like, yeah, yeah, I'm going to be the next big thing. <laughs> I think it just uh, blew all my money on booze. I think <laughs> so I, easily I, done, though, isn't it? You finished so the easy. show and you're in Soho. <laughs> you yeah, like... I put about two stone on. Did you? Yeah, mate, I became... So, I was I was about eight pints a night. <laughs> because there was such a mad, mad fan hysteria with that show... You had Arthur, who was like Doctor Who, mm. and you had, uh, Matthew Lewis, who was Harry Potter, like Doctor Who and Harry Potter. Like people love that. Yeah, yeah. Not me. I'm not seeing any of it. I, I watch football, <laughs> but <laughs> um, but so it was it was mad. Just come out of stage door, and it'd be like it was like we were the Beatles. <laughs> <laughs> and me, I'd obviously just come out of drama school, so I was like, oh yeah, this is this is what it's like. Yeah, it's not what it's like at all. No. Well, let's That's talk fun. about that because obviously oh. this this is you know, I always uh, speak everyone I've interviewed so far. We we talk about this podcast being called staying alive and it's about 
it's about rolling with the punches in in our industries and you know I've, I've already spoken a number of times about sort of when i've done really big gigs and i've gone like you're just saying you know this is me now i'm a rock star you know i, yeah, I, only, yeah. I only do festivals with paul mccartney now and then and then <laughs> the phone just doesn't ring and you know so i know i don't know what the, what the stats are but there's always people saying you know 95 percent of actors are out of work and like yeah. how how have you managed it over the years obviously you've had some great success and but obviously there's times where it must have been tough really tough especially before Indy was born so Indy was born eight months ago mm. um as I think I had like eight months out of work just before that mm. then lucky fate putting the right vibes out just the right thing coming along at the right time mm. got a nice little part in a HBO series and then doing Unforgotten season four for ITV it's just like <sighs> shit i can breathe yeah because before that i was i was doing three jobs i was working call center um i was working selling um haggis toasties in east london and markets um and that can be really humbling as well when people come up to you and go like oh were you jake in crazy head or were you not my yeah, yeah. So i saw you in this you're like and literally i was at a tattoo convention at the xl no, not at the XL. Where is it? Tobacco Docks. Yeah, yeah, I know it. Yeah. Uh, where I'd gone to uh, uh, an event for BAFTA and given out award like a couple of months previously, and now I was now selling toasties. Yeah, wow. And a lady came over and was like, "Oh, can I have a picture? My mate won't believe that you've uh, that that I've seen you here." And it's like it's lovely, and like, oh, we really loved you in that production. But then you're there with like. Yeah, cool. Do you want any ketchup with that? Yeah. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? There's a really weird moment afterwards where you're like, yeah, so that's £5.95, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, because as soon as people see you on TV, they just assume that you're loaded, don't they? It's, it's weird. And, uh, you know, and, and there's such a struggle behind the scenes, you know. I guess the, the difference is between, between your industry and mine is that if I'm super skin, I can go and do a gig in a pub or even go busking or, you know, whatever, or these days do an online gig. But it's, you can't just go and act on the corner, can you? You know? <laughs> yeah, you look like a twat. <laughs> Mental. Yeah. No, but there, is, there is something in that. And then in the last f four years, I think there's been like a natural progression for me personally. And this isn't for everyone because not everyone wants to do this, but I think creating your own work mm. is massive uh, as an... Uh, as an artist and it's just as i think as a person i really stand by it. i think humans by nature are creative you have to have something creative in in your life or i think you just you feel underappreciated undervalued and not as fulfilled is probably the right thing to say and since i started creating my own stuff which probably about four years ago i started writing i started producing my own stuff and I'm about to, you know, start directing now. Those bits in between my acting work, it doesn't, the void doesn't feel as empty anymore. Yeah, yeah. That's, it's that's exactly the same. It's exactly the same for a musician because obviously I do a lot of sort of gun for hire jobs. Yeah. And, and I, I feel like my own, like doing romances and the quotes and write, writing all my own material, like legitimizes all that stuff. Yeah. Otherwise, otherwise, I'm just, I'm just a, a singer that does covers or whatever, you know. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. But I'm not. I'm an artist, you know. And I guess it's, I guess it's the same for you. You know, you're an actor, but you've got all these other strings to your bow. And you obviously you talk about um, your writing and creating and stuff. And you sent me a link to your short film Lola the other day. Yeah. And um, oh mate, I absolutely loved it. It's, you, have, you have to say that now, though, don't you? I, yeah, I do have to say it. But <laughs> say, and also, also, I'm going to put this out there. I'm okay. the worst film critic of all time because I'm so immersed in stuff. I don't look at anything with a critical eye. I'm just like, but but I genuinely loved it. It was it was super heartfelt. And it is is it difficult to get get across? What you're trying to in like such a short space of time because obviously how, how long how long is it is it 15 minutes or 20 minutes 15 minutes it's a short film which is quite yeah yeah neat. um how they're set up i think with a uh a short film people are always trying to either get a feature film made or a tv series made yeah or just it's a really great little short idea and i think a, re a short really has to have like 
that twist of an ending or yeah, yeah. about like a punchline to a joke. Yeah, That's absolutely. How I, I feel about it. Now the film doesn't use any dialogue. Yeah, so exactly. That that was that was really tough because like it sounds really arrogant. You had to really especially when you're filming on that day and you're just two actors in a room and you just have to sort of like look at each other and just know the way that we're gonna cut it up and edit it and put it together with music, there's gonna be a really interesting story there. Mm. Um that that was tough. Yeah, that, yeah. Because when I was like, oh shit, I'm gonna get found out here and this is gonna be really, really shit. No, it's incredible. It it even, you know, it really takes you on a journey from you know, obviously this couple that are obviously having issues and you don't know why. And and I won't give the the, the ending away to anyone who hasn't seen it because I want them to go and see it and as some, whenever they can, you know. When when when, are, when is it going to be available? So it's on, it's on the festival circuit at the moment. It premiered at the Manchester International Film Festival in March, but obviously yeah. because of Corona, everything's sort of been postponed. But it will it'll be I think we will be putting it out online, which is where generally short films will live. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, towards the end of this year, after it's had a nice little festival run, and uh, hopefully people like it. Awesome. Was I'm sorry for my horrendous critique, but I loved it and I thought it was brilliant and it's shot beautifully. Oh, uh, so and much the, fun, it? And the colouring is gorgeous as well. I love all the kind of the. Well, we shot on we shot on film on 38. Yeah. Minute, which gives it that grainy. It makes it look like a, a painting almost sometimes. Yeah. And stuff. It, yeah. No, definitely. And. Yeah, for for a layman like me, it, it definitely looked. Um, you could tell, you know. I didn't know that, but it, you know. Now right. you've said now you've said it. It makes sense, you know. Right? Yeah, yeah. You get we well, get the vibe, don't you? Well, I'm directing something now. I'm about to direct my next shot, and I don't know all the. Okay, we're going to go really tight here. It's going to be an ECU, an extreme close up, right? Yeah. I don't know all that stuff, but I know the vibe. Yeah, yeah. That's why I've because I've done those little bits now. I'm like. You know, as an artist, as we were talking earlier, I'm like, why the fuck am I not doing it? Why am I not backing myself? I'm 32 now. I've got all this experience. Yeah. These contacts, if I don't do it now, I'm never going to do it. Fuck knowing, do you know what I mean, what that frame is or what that camera's called. You can explain to someone, go, look, this is what I want. That's the DOP's job, you know? Yeah. And that that's kind of the same, like working with a record producer or whatever, or an engineer in a studio for us, right. um, you know, because I'm kind of exactly the same as you. I'm, I'm arrogant enough to be like, I know how I want this to sound. And like, yeah. if I, if I can explain that well enough to, to the engineer or the producer I'm working with, then it's their job to kind of help me create that sound. So, you know? so I guess it's similar to what you're saying about the, uh, the dop um so yeah do it and if you're confident enough people will follow yeah yeah and at the end of the day if it's shit no one gives a shit and if it's good do you know what no one gives a shit either (laughs) do you think the only person that is really important to as an artist is yourself isn't it yeah and as soon as you get over that ego thing go right i'm just gonna make it i'm just gonna put it out there you know why don't i do that i wish i'd done this fucking five years earlier or had that attitude you know Absolutely. And yeah. I, I feel totally the same about just when I'm doing um, these online gigs at the moment, obviously, because of the because of the virus. I've just been playing loads of old stuff that I haven't played for a long time, like old quote songs and things. Yeah. Song, songs I wrote when I just... You know me, I love thinking. classics. Yeah, I know you do, mate. <laughs> But, you know, songs I literally wrote when I was about 20, 19, that I just was not even giving a second thought. I was just writing them. Yeah, and actually, you know, it's really freeing. So I'm playing these songs, and I'm not thinking about them. They're just, they're just this thing that I wrote almost in another, in another lifetime. You know, yeah, and yeah it's, exactly. it's been really lovely. That's great. Does it make you want to revisit it, or is that like that? That's done. It's lovely. That's there, or is there? Oh, there's something to explore there. I. It's interesting actually because romances, obviously. It, I think romances is a quite a specific. You, you need to be a fan of a certain type of music to really get romances. It, it's not an easy listening experience. There's a there's a lot going on. It's very kind of the guys in the band are all like real top session musicians. It's quite involved. Right. Whereas that there's which and I love it, you know. And it's it's uh, you know it's, I'm still pouring my heart and soul into it. Yeah. Uh, but the quote stuff. It, it it does have this kind of youthful simplicity to it, and a lot of the, a lot of the fans I've picked up from stuff like the classic rock show and um, 
you know, Thriller and stuff like that, you know, it. I think the, the music is actually more in line to those guys. And, and they, I've had loads of lovely feedback about that stuff. So, I mean, if the boys are up for playing, I'd be well up for playing or maybe doing some writing or whatever, you know, it's... it's um. And I'm definitely thinking about when this is all over, going to do some acoustic shows, and I'll definitely be playing that. Those okay. songs. I'll be front row. <laughs> <laughs> My mum's gonna be shitting a brick knowing that we're doing a little podcast chat together. Ah, oh, bless her. She, she absolutely loves you, man. She's gonna be like, <laughs> "Oh my god, I can't believe it." <laughs> speaking of speaking of shitting a brick, my my little cousin uh, was shitting a brick when when he realised that you were the guy in FIFA. Yeah. Uh, can you talk about that? So, obviously, you played Gareth Walker in, in, FIFA, in FIFA. Yeah, a.k.a. the snake. Yeah, the snake. Uh, that has been probably one of the most favourite, best, surreal, weirdest jobs. Yeah. We started talking. We're ma- both massive football fans. Yeah. So also, we're massive FIFA fans. Yeah. So surreal sometimes. Like, that was, you know, really polite the way he did it, but... You know, most of the time I'll be in a bar and be like, oh, my God, you're that prick. You're, you're, yeah. <laughs> you're like, yeah, hey, mate, yeah, that's me. <laughs> Just having a family moment here. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so how that came about, so it was an audition like any other audition, but sometimes, like, if they're really big, like 20th Century Fox or or, or if they, they want to keep, if it's like Star Wars or something like that, you get a blank script, you have to mm-hmm. sign a little disclosure. And I went into this room, and I think I was auditioning for maybe the, uh, another part or something. I can't even remember. Um, these these uh, Canadian guys, um, and they're like, "Oh yeah, so it's sort of it's going to be like this." And they showed me some footage of this computer game, and I was like, "Okay, this isn't a film." Yeah. And then it was football, and then there was like Eden Hazard in it, and there's like Rio Ferdinand, and I was like, "This is FIFA." So we did this scene, and I was like, I felt quite good, and they laughed at some of the stuff I did. So I was like, okay, cool, this is going well. I was like, sorry, is this? I was like, is this FIFA? <laughs> they were like, oh no, it's just some sort of like modulated uh, thing. Anyway, can we go to scene two? And I was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I was like, yeah, yeah. yeah this is FIFA, isn't it? Though, They're like, yeah, we can't really say. I was like, yeah, but this is FIFA, <laughs> isn't it? So when it turned around, I'd got it, and I got the character of Gareth Walker. I was just like, this is ridiculous, and they flew me out to like. EA Sports in Vancouver where they do it which is just literally like a kid's playground it's exactly how you'd imagine it there's like EA football pitches and EA basketball courts the big symbol I was just like this is an absolute dream did you have to have all the is it like a body scanner thing or something and you have to run around and how did yeah, you do all that and capture so you know Andy Serkis is really famous for it you know you have all these bubbles and yeah. then you know it in the studio space, you've got a big screen and you see yourself not as a full modulated sort of character, but as this sort of stick man and what you're doing. And you'll have like a skeleton layout of like, okay, here's the car. Okay. Then you walk into the house. So it's like, it's like, it's less like film and more like theater mm. playing through the scene and then they'll cut it there and then they'll, they'll put all their stuff in. Whereas right. film and TV, you're like, okay, cool. We'll get this shot here. Mm. Okay, we'll come around and get the other person. Um, but it can be a little bit disheartening because you can be like, oh, yeah, I absolutely smashed it in that scene. Mm. Uh, but if you were just crap, they just take your voice from somewhere else. And if your arm's here, they just take that off and then move you across <laughs> it. <laughs> so, digital. Yeah, you're a bit more of a puppet. Yeah, yeah. But I, yeah, I loved I loved doing that. And then even still, every now and again, you know, you, you know a TV show goes out, you know, like, especially like something like Unforgotten, like quite sort of, you know, it's for, the demographic's probably 30s up. Yeah. Um, but then you obviously get some kid who's watching it with their parents or whatever. It's like, oh, oh fuck, is that Gareth Walker? And I've forgotten. <laughs> Something pop up. Like that. And then just like, snake. And then the snake emoji, <laughs> snake emoji, snake emoji. That's ridiculous. Yeah, I love How it. How much abuse yeah. you get for a character is it's mad. But what was really funny as well was when it first came out, it was like my mum was battling the trolls. Was she? <laughs> yeah, you just got to leave it. She's like, actually, he's a really nice boy at Aaron1269. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. Yeah. And, and did you have to actually play any football? No, but I insist, I let them know that I was really good at keep up. It's just did like you? hoping <laughs> to get something in. Yeah, but, yeah. Because uh, no. you are actually a pretty decent player, to be fair. 
Yeah, 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 yeah. Cheers, boy. Yeah. So are you. So are you. <laughs> Stop lying to me. Yeah. So can can we talk about Unforgotten? Because obviously that's probably is would you say that's your your, your biggest role so far, do you reckon? Um yeah, probably in film. Well, um or you know, maybe Crazy Head that I did for Netflix. Yeah, yeah. I love that uh, show, Crazy Head. I thought it was so fun, actually. It was, it was a good one. I really enjoyed it. Um, but yeah, probably unforgot. I mean, like the people that you get to work with, like Nicola Walker and Sanjeev Bhaskar and Tom Courtney and Trevor Reeve. You know, it's it's, it's, it's a stellar, stellar, stellar cast. So yeah. We're, we're actually in doing season four right now. You're shooting it at the moment, are you? Well, obviously not now, but... But, but yeah, you, got, you sort of got called off. So yeah. It's, it's everyone's, I think, the production is pretty tense for everyone. Everyone's really, you know, you've shot, I think it's probably the best season so far as well. Awesome. Yeah, halfway through the season, do you know what I mean? And you just don't know what people are going to be contractually obliged to do. So you just, everyone's touching wood and hoping that we can get the rest of it in the can. Yeah, that's the issue with create, creative um, people because obviously our schedules have to line up perfectly, don't they? And I, I'm, I'm really worried that... Um, you know, because I've got three or four projects on the go at the moment. I'm worried next year everyone's going to be like, "Yeah, cool, we've rescheduled it all. It's all in March." It's like yeah. brilliant, you know. And I'm sure it's the same for you, scheduling wise. Yeah, it's tough. You just got to stay, stay positive, and just it'll find a way. Everyone's in the same boat, so you just hope that we're all going to have the same understanding and patience, and it'll all it'll come back to normal. It just probably will take a little bit longer than I think, probably probably or than what we all want mm. so you think that'll be out sort of sometime sometime next year yeah, uh i think they're aiming for the autumn are they yeah but i've got i've got something out in june which is the new michaela cole drama which we shot for hbo and bbc one see this is the thing about being friends with an actor you, i woke up this morning and looked at my phone and it's like you're you're in this new HBO drama called I May Destroy You, which I had never heard of. You hadn't mentioned it. It's like, is it? I don't I'm think so. so. <laughs> have, have you? <laughs> yeah. But there, there's quite a lot. There's quite often things you have to keep close to your chest because of contracts, right? Until you until yeah. you can say it and stuff. Yeah. But yeah, what what can you tell us about this this new show then? I I don't think I can say a lot actually. Yeah. Um, it's a show about consent, and it's um the lead in it is. Um, Michaela Cole, who did like chewing gum, um, BAFTA award winner, and I was quite scared um, meeting her and having to work with her because like she's such like a infamous, powerful figure, and she was co-directing, exec producing her production companies on it with HBO and BBC, right. uh, and then you're up, and it was so inspiring. It's totally inspired me. Like, I'm pitching a TV show myself at the moment. I'm pitching the short film. I've got a feature film in development. Um, and all that, sort of, because of the baby and life, and life gets busy, and it's hard, right? Mm-hmm. Um, it's just helped focus me, because I've never, especially, like, as, you know, a strong, independent female, the way she was on set, like, producers would be like, oh, we need to have a meeting, and then an actor would speak to him, like, we need to do this. And the director would be like, oh, do you want to line up for these shots? She was spinning so many plates. And her attitude was just flawless. Mm. Like, I don't know if she went home and, like, like maybe beat up her boyfriend. <laughs> or, like, did loads of coke and heroin. Or <laughs> a load of fucking steam. But she was, like, exceptional. And so uh, in control. And, and so a mate just so, yeah, chill, good about it. And just just cracked on. So I can't really say too much about the show. The trailer's out, um, but she she was uh, she had a real positive effect on me. I, it was a I'm so, I'm so glad I did that job purely just for, for for working with her. It was wicked, and the fact that it's got HBO on it is pretty cool. Yeah, I definitely. Sopranos, you know I mean? mate. Yeah, exactly. So <laughs> I'm pretty much the next Tony Soprano. Yeah, that's exactly what I was thinking. Actually. Yeah. Yeah, I'm oh, actually I'm getting fat enough. Jesus Christ, I keep eating so much. I think I've put about half a stone on Corona weight. I think it to, your weight fluctuates a lot anyway because there's sometimes I see you and you're doing like for example when you were doing my night with Reg, you're just so skinny. 
Yeah, I mean, I mean you, you're you're normal. You're not fat. You you said just saying it, but you know when when you did my night with Reg, I remember being at the pub and you were like, um, tap water with lemon, please. Um, you yeah, know, because obviously you you had to you had to be naked on stage. Yeah, that, that it kind of messed with me a little bit actually. Like, um, the pressure of I thought it was absolutely fine. I've always sort of been comfortable in my skin, and then all of a sudden the pressure of especially being fully naked as well. Like, and I think it, the thought of being judged, do you know what I mean? So I was working out two times a day and then doing two shows. So yeah. I, I don't think it, I, I was very healthy at that time, mentally or physically. I mean, fucking hell, I look great for my Instagram photo. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I, do, I don't think it wasn't, it wasn't quite right. So it's, you know, I think in a lot the film, TV, music industry has a lot to answer for in terms of these unrealistic bodies that we see. Was you that know, anyone putting pressure on you, though, or was that yourself? <sighs> Certainly no one from... There was no... Uh, the director wasn't like, you need to be like this, or a producer wasn't like, you were, you weren't... You, you have to be like this at all. The team was amazing, but just people from who knew the play or what the play was requiring, they'd be like, oh, get into the gym then. Oh, yeah, yeah. You bet, you bet you can't eat that or something like that. So then I think slowly but surely, and all that is, is everyone's insecurities because you put yourself in other people's shoes. Like we're empathetic sort of creatures, aren't we? Oh God, if that was me, I'd want to be, I'd want to look a certain way. Mm think people do that because it's their own fears um and so that sort of started happening and then i had my own fears of it the amount of time that you have to be in that sort of shape for mm. when it's like nearly a year of being like a certain body fat and like because i wanted to be this desirable thing yeah, I think it, I, it, I, I, had to, I learned a lot from it actually. Mm. So I won't be putting myself in that position again. But it was my own, I think my own insecurities. I sort of felt that like I had to look a certain way. You but, can't have any, there's no chill, is there, when you can't have a beer or a biscuit or you're just thinking about everything, you know, every second of the day. And Yeah, fuck like that. Yeah, yeah. Life's too short, man. Have a pint. Have a, I had four biscuits for breakfast. <laughs> <laughs> Did you get better or worse reviews than um, Daniel Radcliffe's penis when he was naked in the West End? I definitely got better reviews, right? <laughs> and as a fact, I had a, my own like forum on it, which my right. mum found. Amazing. So my mum being obviously my biggest fan, she's getting a lot of chat on this, isn't she? But she went on, was like, and the play did really well, which was great. Um, but she went online like Lewis Reams, My Night with Reg, you know, reviews and stuff. Of course, and, she's it, a man. and it talked in detail about like, my ball, <laughs> <laughs> my foreskin, everything. My mum was like, oh, oh, God, oh, God, no. Amazing. <laughs> well, if you, if you let us know, we can put it in the uh, description of the podcast. Oh, yeah, um, absolutely. I'll do that with <laughs> Gareth Walker. <laughs> was that... Uh, also, the the poster itself caused quite a stir, didn't it? Because it because uh, it, it was too revealing, apparently. Because your your bum was basically plastered all over the Soho. Yeah, and they met... the first time. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, they made you take it down. That was a bit silly, wasn't it? Yeah, I th I think it's probably a very well. It what it turned out to be a very clever press move. Mm -hmm. So it was me with like the David Bowie Ziggy Stardust uh, album cover, um, standing all. Uh, Roman statuesque, but with my bare bum out. Um, and they got loads of press up. So they put it on the tube and then literally they took it all down and then it was like in the evening standard and sort of got like shock horror, young man's bum. Yeah, I remember. Um, I loved it. Yeah. It <laughs> You're the guy with the bum. I am the guy with the bum. Hi, how's it going? Yeah. <laughs> I'll have a lager top, please. Or the, a... the, play, the play itself, um, it was another... Um... Was it another challenging role for you? I mean, you were sort of the eye candy for for this group of sort of older gay men, weren't you? Yeah, I mean, it was it's from the Dunmore Warehouse, which is a really respected theatre company. Yeah. 
London, like they've just done everything and everything amazing. They thought sort of last 20 years. Um, so the only challenge for myself was like raising my standards to their, their standards. You know, it was really eye opening. I just got to work with an amazing company and uh, amazing group of people. The only, the, actually the really challenging thing was getting naked for the, but getting naked in front of 800 people at the Apollo is absolutely fine. Cause you've got, lights like this you can't really see anyone you might hear the odd oh my god that lad's got his cock out <laughs> <laughs> but that's it doing it in like in a quite an intimate rehearsal room with just your set designer the director and the guy that you're doing the scene with and it's like okay clothes off mm. pants off and you do the scene that's that's and i was like it's very cold in here all of a sudden yeah <laughs> <laughs> it's like going for a checkup or something yeah uh, it was it was here honestly <laughs> was the uh you just mentioned it, like the audience there when you're doing a play like that is it can the audience be really distracting if they're making noise and stuff i mean i remember being in the west end and obviously we, we, when i was doing thriller it, it's a sort of bombastic loud dancey you know i mean not me dancing but you know uh, basically a rock and pop gig um and you you know there'd be the odd hilarious thing that would sort of be a bit off thing i remember once we were doing can you feel the end of act one and there was a couple and they were in the they were in the right in the middle of the stalls seats you know sort of h eight and nine like the most expensive but, seats okay. and they were they were totally like fast asleep like and they're, they're their heads on each other's shoulders right in the middle of the auditorium Great. and um the, we had these streamers that popped so it went can you feel it can you feel it can you feel it boom end of that one and they and they shot streamers out over the audience and that woke them up and it it was like That's amazing it was the funniest thing ever so you get stuff like that but you know it doesn't affect our gig you know so okay yeah i suppose you could power on with with music can't you you've got some, yeah uh no i can't say when, when I mean, when the when a play gets really big fan base, you have people who come all the time, mm. and sometimes we've had like people at the front reciting your lines. That's off putting. Which is really really tough when you're like trying to do a line and you're like, someone else is saying it for you, and you're like, mm. fuck, this is really like, trick. Yeah. It's How like, do you make that feel like you're saying it for the first time when somebody's? <laughs> yeah. You just look at them and go, shut the fuck up. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's tough. I did. I have. I can't. I. I had a really bad moment in that. I had one of the biggest stage drives I've ever had. Did you? And it was at the beginning of like a two-page monologue. Oh, no. Um. And it was about like the first time that um. Uh, my character was in it, Eric. He that he'd like um not lost his virginity, but like the m most. It was like a real romantic thing for him. This thing that happened. Uh, and Johnny Broadbent, uh, his character Guy, said, and how did that make you feel? Uh, and I went, well, and I'm sitting on a couch, like centre stage, and I'm looking out, and I'm like, okay, I'm going to do my bit now. <laughs> you know, I'm going <laughs> to do my bit. I'm going to win my Olivier here. Um, and I went, well... <gasps> and I thought, I was like, shit, I'm at the beginning, and I was like, I just... I just don't know what's coming next. And Johnny Broadbent, bless him, amazing stage actor, kept feeding me lines just to get me through. How did that make you feel? And then what happened? Oh, and did this, did it. But I ended up making it sound like he raped me. So it gave it a completely <laughs> different feel and made it really dark. And then we all came off stage and I was like, ah, you're a fucking idiot. <laughs> that, yeah. was, that was, oh God, even thinking about it, it makes me feel, feel myself sweating. Do you know what? It happens to the best of us, mate. There's so many times I, I had this same chat with my friend Wayne as well. Like when you're just about to start the first line of a song and it might be it might be something you've done a million times and it's so deep in your subconscious. But as soon as you start thinking about it, you're in you're in your conscious mind. Right. So you're. Yeah, you're, you're looking, and then then you start the the anxiety takes over, and then and yeah. then you just go, oh, I don't know what this is. And for me, luckily, ninety nine percent of the time, the word will just come into my head. On the last tour I just did, it was Freebird, um, 
uh, Leonard Skinner, you know, if I leave here tomorrow, it just gone. And literally, and it's a really long intro. It's about 32 bars worth of guitar. Shit, what do you do? And I was, of the whole 32 bars, my heart was going, <laughs> and I was just panicking. And it's like, it's like, you know, 1500 people there. And then literally I played the first chord and I went, if I le-, and it just came out. And oh, I was in my brain. brain. Yeah, it was. It's a really weird thing, actually, because in my brain I'm going, shit, shit, fuck. <laughs> I think I think it's tougher for you guys because I can sort of like style it out. Like I've dropped glasses on stage before. I've kicked a door open when it wasn't meant to. I'm pretty <laughs> But you can kind of like, oh, is that meant to be part of the play? If if that the the music's coming, your cue is coming. Mm. And it's going to continue with or without you. Yeah, exactly. Got you got, you got. I think it's tougher to do what you've got to do. Apparently, oh, it, gets, sure. it gets um, gets tougher as you get older. They say with that muscle memory, it's like a train. So that like a train mm. comes to your stop, and then you say your line, you get on the train, and then you sort of go off. Whereas, like, what starts to happen as you get older is. You know the train's coming, mm-hmm. you're just not quite sure when, and by the time you <laughs> sort of remembered, the train's fucked off. Right. Totally missed it. Oh, we've got that look to look forward to. Yeah, yeah I think that's yeah. amazing. My, my friend uh, Tyrone, uh, who was in Thriller with me, he told me about this time where he was doing Dirty Diana, and he just he just couldn't remember the words. And he he's a great kind of like soul R&B singer, Right. And he did that. He he scattered the whole first verse. He's like, he still doesn't do it. And he went, she's saying that's okay. And he came back in there in the pre in the pre in the pre chorus. And he, he said, I just can't remember the words at all. Like, <laughs> oh, <laughs> show must go on. <laughs> yeah, that's hilarious. Right, yeah. mate, I'm, I'm not going to keep you too much longer. I just want to, there's this section I've been doing with everyone called One Night Only. And I, I, I imagine I know what you're going to opt for. So there's two options. Oh, sorry. Okay. There's, it's going to put you on the spot. There's this, either a super group, i.e. you can be in any band you want with any members for one night only and do, do a gig. Oh, so if, if you pick that option, what would you play and who would be in your band? Or option B is a five-a-side football team and you can pick any players alive or dead. Oh, my God. Can I can I have a five-a-side football team with a mate like Freddie Mercury? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Five-a-side football team. I think I'm going to go for that. Oh, that's really tough. Um, okay. No, I'll go for a five-a-side footy team. Okay. Sorry, right. any music fans listening. <laughs> and now... I often think about things like this, and I th- I like to think I'd like to play with the people. When I have most fun at football, it's because I identify with the people that are m- most like me in my working life. Is that why you wanted Freddie Mercury in there? Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> you know how I get my roles. <laughs> um, I think I'd have, like, JJ Okocha. Yes. I'd have... Um, I have Dean Windass up front. Wow. <laughs> um, I have Jersey Dudek in goal. Yes, old school. I'd have Roberto Carlos. Just for free kicks alone. Yeah, exactly. How many is that? Jersey. That's four, JJ. isn't it? That's four. You can have a couple of subs if you want. Um, no Stevie G in there. I wouldn't have him in five a side. Yeah, Do you, I'm thinking. I'm thinking specifically. I'm thinking. I'd have Gaza. Gaza, yeah. We've already had him once, actually. Really? What a player he was. I've got to watch his documentary. My friend Tom um, told me to go and watch his documentary, and it's on Netflix at the moment. But oh my God, it's amazing. Have you seen it? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I cried. Mm. Have you watched the um, the Sunderland documentary? I've just finished watching that. Oh my God, it's amazing. It's so heartbreaking, isn't it? You want <laughs> you want to do well so much, and especially have you watched first or second season? Both, yeah. Yeah, so Doncaster went to the playoffs. We got to the semi-final. Charlton yeah. knocked us out. 
ridiculous. I don't want to get into it. It still hurts. <laughs> and I was watching that documentary as a Rovers fan and still wanting Sunderland because they are such a there's such massive investment or has been in that club and you just know that they're on they're constantly on the edge. Mm. And that city, that's that's all that you know a lot of people have. Well, I was trying to explain it because because obviously Bear coming from Finland. I mean, she gets she gets football and she she can she understands now, having lived here for a few years, what it means to me and my friends and you know the people around. Yeah. But but um you know when there's people you know sort of men and grown men and women crying and you know being really aggressive and swearing, she just she doesn't understand that coming from Finland. They don't have you know they they're very stoic people anyway. The Finns they don't let oh, their emotions yeah. out. So she she finds it all a bit strange, and I I was trying to explain to her because she didn't see the first episode, which is the setup really of you know the, the town and the you know the way that it was a shipping town and kind of a lot of the work sort of doesn't happen there anymore and it's quite yeah. poor, uh, you know and and she um you know and it just it is life or death to these people, isn't it? It's just it's everything. Nice. It's community, isn't it? Yeah. Exactly, and like I was explaining, like if the if the games aren't in the Premier League, they're you know so obviously now they're in League One. That you know the the tourism money, the the taxi drivers, the local shops, you know the the whole economy just takes a hit, you know. So it means so much to these people, you know. Um, So yeah, I thought it was brilliant. I love that documentary. It's it's fantastic, and you can't help but feel. I don't know if they're doing a season three right now. Their their look, and then obviously, I think where they are in the in League One, they're on the brink of maybe trying to get in into playoffs. Mm. I don't know what the financial implications are going to be for them right now. Yeah. They're, they're so dependent on ticket revenue. Yeah. Not having people in the stadium, you know, every four or five days for a match. Mm. And it's not like they're going to get tons of TV money either, is it? Exactly. It's got to be really... It's, it's, it's worrying times. That we're that we're all in, but yeah, it's tough. If I heard the word unprecedented one more time, now <laughs> go mental. I know. So what what's next for you, mate? After all this, is there anything else in in uh, production that you can tell us about? Or so thinking positively. Yeah, um, thinking we you know we can all come out of this soon safely and um, back into the normal world. I'll start. Um, my the the Michaela Cole series will come out in June. Yeah. Um uh I'll finish Unforgotten, which will be out hopefully autumn, maybe winter now, maybe early next year. And then something I'm really excited about, I'm directing my first short film called Harry the Hamster. Amazing. Um, which I think is gonna be really, really, really good. Um uh, and I've got a few things in development. So there's lot there's lots of little projects on the horizon I'm just sort of like we've had this great moment of stillness and I've really refined a lot of creative projects as probably a lot of people and I'm ready to put them into place now but I'm sort of just just waiting keeping positive sending things out um so yeah I'm re- I'm, I'm really looking forward to doing Harry the Hamster it's a story about um it's a true story that happened to me and my granddad um it's just a little short film I'm going to do for five minutes it's going to be sort of like Wes Anderson inspired who did like Grand Budapest Hotel so really yeah, yeah. meet sort of Taiki Waititi I sort of that's the sort of analogy that I'm sort of using um it's gonna be really nostalgic really funny hyper stylized uh, and I, I'm just really excited to get into that that's sort of what's taking up my time I'm just amazing dying to get out and get it done I can't wait to see it mate it's such a yeah, we, you know, we take the piss out of each other, but it's honestly such a privilege to see you doing so well. And uh, yeah, oh, you too, bro. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for doing this, mate. I really appreciate it. Oh, mate, I fucking love you. And I fucking love you. So there we have it. I really hope you enjoyed that conversation. To keep up to date with Lewis, you can follow him on Twitter at Lewis Reeves One. <laughs> I'm going to keep next week's guest under my hat for a minute, so I'll update you about that one on due course, but make sure you tune in next week as it's going to be an amazing episode. This was a Jesse Smith production. Music by Neil X, Mark Garfield, and me. 
You can get in touch with the pod by emailing stayinalivepod at gmail.com. We would love to hear from you. Until next time, stay in touch, take care of each other, and try to stay alive, eh? Thank you.